Hello everyone, this video is about quantitative research methods. I'm going to talk really fast and we're going to talk about a lot of different types. So I highly recommend you open up the guide to quantitative research designs and be filling that out in parallel um, or at least afterwards to ensure that you got at least something out of this and adding to your toolbox. All right, so here research questions for all of these are focused on describing a setting or a group quantitatively looking at differences between variables or groups, looking at associations, looking at relationships between variables, and then causation as well, if you can get causation, which is hard. So in order to get causation, you have to be able to show that variable A is related to variable B, and that A comes before B, and that the relationship between A and B is not affected due to other variables interacting with that relationship. So you have to rule out every other explanation between A and B. Good luck. So just an FYI, there is a difference between random sampling and random assignment. So when we are sampling, the ideal gold standard is to have a random sample. So we get everybody in a group and then we pull names out of a hat or however we want to go about a random sample. Random assignment means that once we have our sample, we are then assigning them to comparison groups. So they are being randomly chosen and randomly assigned to groups. Research design all depends on random assignment. So if we can randomly assign, then we can do an experimental design. If we cannot randomly assign and we still have random sampling, then we can do a quasi-experimental design. If we don't have a control group, um, we can do non-experimental and you can also get away with less random sampling with non-experimental research. All right, here's some of the designs. Experimental research. This is focused on cause and effect, very much a relationship. A affects B. We're looking at the word effect we can use here. You must have random sampling and random assignment, and the sample size is quite large. You have to do a power analysis to really understand how big of a sample you need. But it's fair to say 100 is probably too small, 1,000 might also be too small, depending on what you're looking at. These are all based on the idea of weak and strong, and it has to do with how controlled is your environment. So we are trying to control as many things as possible and only focus on variable A and variable B and rule out everything else. Think about this in education, seriously. Good luck. With weak experimental designs, they're not controlling for a lot of the confounding variables, the things that could affect and go into this relationship. Strong experimental designs control for almost everything that they possibly can. So weak experimental designs, here's a couple examples. A one group post test only. So we have a reading program, we were going to do the reading program, and then we were going to test them after it. Easy, but very, very weak. A one group pre post design is getting better. So we pre test our group, we give them the reading intervention, and then we post test the group and we compare the effect of the treatment. A post-test only with non-equivalent groups is also very weak. So we have intact groups and we do one is experimental and one is control. So if these were classrooms, two classrooms that are already set, one gets the reading intervention, the other doesn't. We post-test both of them. That's great, but we don't know that the classrooms are actually equivalent. So we would have to show that before we could even do this. Strong experimental designs. This would be kind of the gold standard. A pretest, a post test, there's an experimental group, there's a control group, there's a lot happening. Um, and the key thing here is that we are randomly assigning our groups to experiment and control. Then we pretest both of them, we give the reading intervention, and then we post test both of them. This is incredibly hard to take a random sample of students and then randomly assign them to classrooms, randomly assign who is the control and who is experimental, and then go through the whole thing. It's very hard. We can do a post-test only. 
So same idea, randomly assigned to two groups, but we have no pretest here, so it's a little bit more weak, um, but it's still a stronger design than the others. We can do a repeated measures design. So here we have three groups, and everyone in all three groups gets all three treatments, but we do them in different orders. So here, classroom one gets treatment one and then a rest or then a test. Then it gets treatment two and a test, and then it gets treatment three and a test. So there's going to be three different reading interventions, maybe. Um, group two would get treatment two and then tested, treatment three and then tested, treatment one and then tested. The hardest part about this is you have to worry about the carryover effect. Um, so a reading intervention probably isn't going to be an appropriate tool here because this treatment is going to be carried over to these here. There is a study on tasting beers. So they gave three different groups and three different beers and you get to pick your favorite. Um, the second beer was never chosen. So they either liked the first one or they liked the last one which kind of makes sense. Um, also by the third one, you have a good amount of alcohol in you. So you gotta worry about that carryover effect. So quasi and single study, single case designs, not a case study, a single case design. Um, these happen when you can't assign random, you can't do random assignment. It's not always possible. So we still have control groups and some comparisons happening, but no random assignment. If you want to make cause and effect um, statements, it's incredibly hard. And you have to rule out the rival hypotheses can be very hard. And making those inferences is a little bit, um, it's not as strong as these true experiments. So we're going a little bit away from the internal validity idea here. Oh, fun. I didn't know I did that. Um, <laughs> So here we have non-equivalent groups. So these are just classrooms that are already intact. We're not randomly assigning anybody. They're already here. But we still have an experiment and a control. The pretest, do the treatment, post-test. That's the most frequent design used in education. Interrupted time series is another um, interesting one. And here we are taking multiple pretests to get a really solid baseline then doing a treatment and taking multiple post tests, which also allows us to see carryover and kind of long term effects. So this can be really beneficial. So here you can see that the classroom was pretty much right in here on their reading scores. And then we have a intervention happening. And then after the intervention, it dips a little bit, but it stays pretty much up here. A single case experiment means we have one person that we are trying to investigate a treatment on. This is used all the time in action research, in um, counseling, in psych, where you were really focusing on the behavior of one person and trying to ask questions about it. So for example, if we had a kid with ADHD and we want to see if this drug is going to actually help them. <laughs> so we're just focusing on one kid here. We do an experiment and we have a couple different options. So we can do the baseline treatment baseline like we did, we just talked about. We can also do A, B, A, B. So we can do a baseline without the drug where their behavior is at. We can do a baseline um, with the drug, a baseline without the drug, give the drug back and have a baseline again. So this baseline versus this baseline is better, but definitely there seems to be an effect with this treatment over time. The hard part about that one is that we are removing something that has worked, and that is unethical in a lot of these cases. So if we're trying to help the student do better in school and we found a way to help them focus and then we take away all of those supports, that's not really ethical. So here, we are looking at multiple baselines and we are looking at more than one student. So same idea, but we're looking at, let's say three for this example. So here we have three kids, one, two, three. Kid um, right here, he starts the treatment, it increases and he continues on that. The next one, 
has not started the treatment, then it starts the treatment and it increases. Here we have another multiple baseline and it increases. So this is a way to show that the treatment is working without having to remove um, the treatment that's actually helping the student. Non-experimental quantitative research. This is not qualitative. We are still taking um, quantitative data. And the difference here is that we're not manipulating a variable. We are studying nature, we are studying what has already occurred, we are just looking at what we have in general. And a lot of times um, what we're interested in can't be manipulated or has already occurred. For example, if you're looking at the effects of smoking um, during pregnancy, you cannot randomly assign a baby to a smoking or non-smoking comparison group. That's not okay. <laughs> So here we are going to determine what's the problem, what are our hypotheses, select the variables, um, collect them, and then the analysis is going to be based on multiple statistics options. So think about your intro stats course if you have ever taken one. These are t-tests and z-tests and correlation, regression, chi-square, there's all kinds of different um, statistic options that we can use. And then we interpret the results of these based on confidence level and alpha and p-values and we make that decision there. Got it? Probably not, but go back and fill out that reference guide and you can add it to your toolbox. Big ideas here, I want you to be able to compare experimental, quasi-experimental, single case, and non-experimental research.